since we're missing a speaker, I'm just going to be here for an hour and a half. No. <laughs> Uh, no, I'm kidding, but uh, I do set a timer to try to get you guys out in time. So uh, we are going to be going through Hosea. I, too, will be spending my this morning or this afternoon in Hosea 1. Um, and we're going to be talking about just God's amazing love. And so uh, God is so good to us. I don't know what um, or where God found you. I know where God found me. I know what I was. I have always loved the scripture, uh, Romans 5a where it says but God demonstrated his love in that he died for us while we were yet sinners and so I I love that he didn't wait for me to become who I am today he loved me when I was trash you know he loved me when I was still where I was and he but he didn't leave me there and so we're going to be talking about this extreme love and God's extreme love and that lavish love and what it looks like uh and we know that God is so good to us but I want to I want you guys to ask have we been good to God You know, have we been good to God? Because we know that he is a good God. He is a good father. He's a good husband. Um, But are we good brides? And so that's what I kind of want you to start with as I start off to have that question in mind. And so Hosea 1.1 says, The word of the Lord that came to Hosea, the son of Bere, in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. I'm assuming that these names were super popular during this time. And even though we have a a hard time saying it, I'm assuming everyone. Every other kid had these names, right? But these were all the kings of Judah. And then it also says, in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, who was the king of Israel. So all of this to say that Hosea's ministry took place in 760 BC all the way to 720 uh, 720 BC, which means this is 720 years before Jesus even stepped into the scene you know we live in the in the beauty of like the reality of jesus already having come the new testament and all of that but we're talking about 700 and some years before christ and this is the time that hosea was ministering but this is also a time when things were so politically and economically successful and prosperous in these kings that the leaders and the people didn't think they needed god anymore They didn't think they needed God anymore. They didn't look to God the way they once had. They didn't look to God the way they still should. Because they were living in a time of prosperity. And so they were no longer in bondage like they had been under the weight of Egypt. And they were no longer wandering in the wilderness. And they no longer were starving for manna from heaven or water from a rock. They no longer needed God to supernaturally provide for them. They no longer needed God to rescue them from all the many enemies. To you know, to give them the water, to clothe them, to give them everything that God had given them supernaturally they could not do these things for themselves god had brought them to a place after he had freed them fed them clothed them provided for them fought for them he gave them their own land and the ability to stand strong he had done all of these things for him but instead of being drawn closer to god because of the goodness of god they took it for granted and they forsook the lord We're told in the Old Testament that they became idolatrous and they became morally corrupt. And listen, the same can become true of you and I today. For many years now, America has lived in a time of peace and prosperity. I have watched many documentaries about World War I and World War II and a time when America had to intervene in war. But I, in my 48 years, have never known a day of war. Since living in America, I have known freedom, I have known peace, I have known prosperity, and even though I was raised by a poor immigrant parents, I have never known a day where I did not have something to eat. And so I have always lived in America in a time of peace and prosperity, and for many of us personally, we have lived in a time of peace and prosperity. We're no longer in bondage to sin. We're no longer living in the wilderness of where I used to. For me, it was South Central LA. I don't know what your wilderness was, but I'm no longer in this wilderness. I'm no longer starving. I'm no longer thirsty. I'm no longer like maybe strung out. I'm no longer in juvenile halls. I'm no longer doing all of these things. The Lord has taken me out of so much. And the same is true about you. You are no longer where you once were. 
No, God himself has freed us. He has provided for us. He has fought for us. He has strengthened us. He has enabled us. He has given us a message. But unfortunately, when all is good in our lives, rather than be drawn to God, rather than living a life that demonstrates our gratitude to God, we stop looking to God the way we once did. We stop being so desperate for God. I remember a time where I didn't think I could see till the end of the week and I was desperate for God. I would wake up to worship and I, would, I had to be in my word. I could not leave myself alone with my own thoughts. I remember being desperate. Do you? And so sometimes our strength and our independence makes us not be desperate for God anymore. We lose our love for God and we no longer have a desire to chase after Him, to worship God. Instead, we love and we desire all sorts of other things and other people. We too can become idolatrous. Eventually, we don't have any time. We don't have money. We don't have resources for the things of God. Because we poured every bit of us into the pursuit of pleasure, education, career, or maybe just acceptance. You have no time to serve in your church. You have no money to tithe to your church. Even though they're good to you, you're not good to them. Even though God is good to you, you're not, you're not good to Him. Because we've given all of ourselves, we've emptied ourselves chasing after lesser things. We begin to look no different in the eyes of God as the people of Hosea's time. That is why our churches are empty. That is why our churches are poor and desperate and begging for servants. You know, at our church, we're constantly having to announce and, and remind people that there's a, a need for servants, that the children's ministry needs servants. Why do we have to be reminded? Because we're chasing after all sorts of things. And lastly, because God no longer guides us, because he no longer impacts us, we have no moral standard, no moral compass. We begin to buy into this world and everything it's offering, and we live a life of moral decay and spiritual harlotry. That's where it ends. When you stop chasing God, you're going to chase after something. This heart has a hole. And what are you sticking in that hole? You're either going to stick God into that hole or you're going to try to fit a whole lot of other things into it. And so we want to make sure that we have a moral compass. And that is because we're spending time with God, with our spiritual husband. So God had to be drastic. He had to set this vivid picture for them. When that bride walked in today, it was Sharon's way of saying, take a look, understand the message that is being shared to you today. It is a visual picture of things that sometimes we cannot understand spiritually. And that is what God was doing with Hosea and asking him to marry a prostitute. He's saying, God was saying, the sin is dangerous. The sin is destruction. I know the cost and I know where that's taking them. I've got to get drastic. I have to paint a vivid picture. I am going to ask a holy man to marry an unholy prostitute. It doesn't get any more drastic than that. I wonder, are we drastic about our sin today? Maybe we will see in others what we can't see in ourselves. Maybe we can look at the story of Hosea and his cheating wife, Gomer, and say today, I don't want to be like her. I see what that looks like. I don't want to be that. I don't want to be a Gomer. And that is my hope for you this morning, that in looking at this story, you will see yourself in the story and say, I don't want to be that. In Hosea 1 verse uh, 2 through 3, it goes on to say, when the Lord began to speak to Hosea, the, the Lord said to Hosea, Go, take yourself a wife of harlotry and children of harlotry. For the land has committed great harlotry by departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. So here he tells, he tells Hosea, go take for yourself. Listen, what God was asking Hosea to do was not easy. It defied his logic. He was a man of God, but God had a purpose. 
God had a purpose in it. Hosea would not have done this. Hosea would not have married willingly a prostitute. He would not have done this had, not, had God not spoken to him. If he wasn't absolutely sure that the thing that he was about to do was something that God had asked him to do, I can guarantee you that Hosea would not have woken up one day and said, I am going to go marry a prostitute. He would not have done it. And I know in my life there have been things that God has asked me to do that, listen, had God not asked me to do it, I would not have done it. I would not have done it. Forgiving my husband early on in our marriage when I found out that he had been unfaithful to me. I would not have done that because I grew up with a cheating father. And I had said that I would never do that. I would never take back a cheating husband. And I had made it really clear in dating. I had made it really clear in marriage. And yet in my marriage, when I did find out that it had happened, God said, Sonia, you are able to forgive. I want you to forgive. And I'm not saying that that's for you. I'm saying that was for me. That was for me. Or when my best friend fell in love with my husband and God told me, you're never going to be friends with her anymore, but I need you to forgive her or you're going to get bitter. And I said, if you're asking me to do this, Lord, I will forgive her. Or when people in the church hurt my children, people I allowed in my home, people who I allowed in my space, people who I did life with, turned around and, and took the things they knew about me and the vulnerability that we offered to them. And they hurt my children. And God said, I want you to forgive them. And if they come in through the doors of your church, you're still to minister to them and be Christ-like to them. I can tell you that had God not said it, I would not have done it. That I took that to the Lord like Gideon and I laid fleece after fleece and I said, Lord, did you say? Lord, did you say? But that when I heard the Lord say, I had to obey. And so Hosea had to obey. And I wonder, what is God asking you to do today? I'm sure it isn't easy, but listen, if God is asking you to do it, you must say yes. You must say yes to him, no matter how crazy it is and how crazy you must look to everybody else. Your life can be a vivid picture that God is trying to draw, a drastic message that God is trying to communicate to the people watching you, the people listening to you. You know, my circle of impact is different than yours. If you're young here, I can't go into your high school. If you're at, at your job, I can't go into your work of employment. At your family's house, I can't go there, but you can. And God has a message and he's trying to communicate it and deliver it through you. So what is God asking you to do? What is God asking you to change? What step of faith is God asking you to do? God knows how to communicate. God knows how to get his children's attention. But are you listening when he speaks? If you are not listening to his words, you will hear him loud and clear when he acts. Are you going to listen to him? The best lessons are taught when God is just teaching. Don't wait until you have to get spanked. Don't wait until the lesson has to come another way. You get to choose. How am I going to learn this lesson? The Bible said that the, that the person who's, he says, God is faithful to complete that which he started. God is going to get you from point A to point B, but are you going to go kicking and screaming? How are you going to get there? God is going to get you there. You're going to get there, but you decide how you're going to learn the lesson, how you're going to get there. He says that he was to take a wife of harlotry. What a scandal. Can you imagine your pastor or your leader in the church today being joined in marriage to a prostitute? Can you imagine what people would think of him being married to a woman? who would repeatedly cheat on him, no matter how righteous he was, no matter how good he was to her, how many times he took her back, how many times he went after her and chased her, you would think he was crazy. He shouldn't take her back. I'm sure you and everybody in the church would think about it, talk about it. Listen, that was exactly what God wanted the children of Israel to do. He wanted them to talk about it. He wanted them to see what was happening and consider it. They too would have been shocked to see Hosea married to Gomer. 
Gomer was a prostitute, a sinner, a woman who repeatedly cheated on Hosea, someone who deserved judgment. In that time, they could have taken her out and stoned her. And that would have been righteous judgment. They could have, that's what her sin deserved. But Hosea was a righteous prophet. He was a good husband. Listen, he deserved better. But guess what? So does God. So does God. God deserves better. He doesn't deserve to have us running around on him, us cheating on him. He is righteous. If God took us out today and gave us what we deserve, we wouldn't like it. We wouldn't like it. But God is a good husband. Isaiah 54, 5 says, For, the, for your maker is your husband, and the Lord of hosts is his name. And your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. So instead of taking us out and giving us what we deserve, instead He redeems us. He pays the price that we deserve. He did for us what we could never do for ourselves. You know, there are so many times that I didn't like myself when I was in and out of juvenile halls, when I couldn't stop doing the stupid things that I was doing and I wanted to change and I didn't know how God did for me what I couldn't do for myself. And he did that in salvation and he's doing that through transformation. And so know that, that we have a good God. Our maker is our husband. Who knows you better than your maker? The Bible says that before you ever took a breath, before the minute you were conceived, God knew everything about you. God knew the ones in here were going to be temperament. And God knew the soft and the caring ones. And it's okay because he made you that way. He didn't want all of you guys to be cookie cutter. He had a design for you. And he has a purpose for you. Your maker is your husband. Who can you trust more? Who can know you the way God knows you and still love you? We don't even love ourselves on most days. A lot of people, they love us because they don't know us. Right? How many people do you truly let in all the way? We know our thoughts and we know our hearts. God knows those things and he still loves us. And so our maker is our husband. And then Hosea 1.3, it goes on to say, So he went and took Gomer, the daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to him, call his name Jezreel, which means scattered. For in a little while, I will avenge the bloodshed of Jezreel on the house of Jehu and bring an end to the king, to the kingdom of the house of Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jezreel. So here God instructed Hosea to name his three children. He was going to eventually have three children with her. And all three of his children were going to be named in a way that revealed the heart and the judgment of God. Every single one of them. And the first one was Jezreel, which meant scattered. So the first child was a son named Jezreel. And again, that name means scattered because that's what he was going to do to the people. He was going to scatter them. No longer were they going to be a strong nation with fortified walls and protection. God was going to remove his hand. God is going to remove his hand of protection. And the enemy was going to come and he was going to scatter them. And a lot of times you and I, we think we stand strong, but it's only because the hand of God is still with us. If God simply took away his hand of protection, there is an enemy who the Bible tells us is trying to destroy us. And so God doesn't even have to do anything. He says, let me just remove my covering and I'll show you what the, I'll show you what the world wants to do with you. And so he was going to let them, let the world have their way. He was going to remove his hand of protection. And so his name was a declaration of God's judgment. God was about to bring judgment into the kingdom of Israel. For something that they had done in the valley of Jezreel many years ago. So it had actually been like three generations ago. This name Jezreel was an actual place. Can you imagine if God did this to you? If one of the spiritual leaders in your church named their child after the city that you had a hidden sin in. If maybe somebody named their kid Las Vegas. (laughs) Or Tijuana, or L.A., or Oxnard, I don't know. And you're like, oh, is the Lord trying to tell me something? Uh Uh-oh. 
I didn't think anybody knew. I didn't think the Lord was actually going to do anything about that. And so he names this child after the place where undealt with sin had occurred. God was going to allow the Assyrian army to conquer them and scatter them. And so again, in this valley of Jezreel, the previous king, which was the great-grandfather of Jeroboam, who is now the existing king, had slaughtered people. He had, through his order, not through his own hands, but through his command, had had all of the descendants, all the children and grandchildren, any boy who could have inherited the, the throne, he had them all killed, and 70 of them were beheaded. And the, the heads of these 70 descendants were brought to the great, great grandfather. And so God didn't forget. God, God hadn't forgotten. Now, many years later, God was letting them know that he had not missed it or forgotten what they had done. And that although God's judgment might seem a little slow coming, it was coming for sure. Undealt with sin, unrepented sin, still will be judged. And so the same is true for you and I today. If you have unrepented, hidden sin, I want to encourage you today to confess it and repent. Don't wait until God declares judgment on you. Don't wait until the consequences come upon you. Psalms 90 verse 8 says, You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. And then Hebrews 4, 12 through 13 says, For the word of the Lord is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, of joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So it doesn't matter if you hid it from your husband. It doesn't matter if you hid it from your pastor. It doesn't matter if you hid it from your mom or your friends or anybody else, because the one you have to give an account to saw it. To him, it's like you did it in the, late, in the daylight. Like you, you just, he can see your thoughts. Even when you don't act on them, he can see that you want these things. And so we must must confess these sins and repent. Listen, although God's judgment might seem slow coming to you, you can be sure that it is coming for sure. Why not rather repent and receive God's forgiveness and mercy? Why not rather repent and receive God's mercy? It seems so obvious to me. I want you to consider this scripture, Proverbs 28, 13. It says, he who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. It means that even when you do confess to God the thing you did, he is not going to give you what you deserve. He's going to show mercy. And that even if you do have to face the consequences, you won't face them alone. So why would you not come to God on his terms? Why would you rather wait until God has to come after you and show you and teach you a lesson? Why do we do that? Hosea 1.6 went on to say that she conceived again and bore a daughter this time. Then God said to him, call her name Lo Ruhamah, which means no mercy. For I will no longer have mercy on the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. Yet I will have mercy on the house of Judah. I will save them by the Lord their God and will not save them by bow, nor by sword, or battle, nor by horses or horsemen. He says, I'm going to save them. And I'm going to make it really clear, it's me. No bow, no horses. I don't want you to try to take credit. I'm doing the work. I'm going to punish this part of Israel or this part of the children of, you know, of the Jews. And then because it was like divided between the northern and the southern kingdoms. He's like, this part I'm going to save. This part I'm going to, I have to, I have to show them no more mercy. So to me, it's kind of like when the parent counts to three. I never count. You know, it's like, I don't know why. I don't know that we should do that. Should we do that? 
Because we're kind of like instilling in them that, that, you know, they get to sin for two seconds. <laughs> it's like, but, you know, you hear, the, you hear the parent like, stop it. One. And they always like really drag it out. Two. And then some of the kids will stop at two. But there's that kid. There's always that hard kid. And, you know, they're not going to stop until the chancla flies or across the room, right? <laughs> and so the, here comes the number three and, you know, the spanking. And so, so, you know, that's kind of like this. Like God said, I had, you had three generations and you have not repented. It's only gotten worse. You're more idolatry, idolatrous. You don't seek me. You're chasing after all these other things. You're killing each other. You're doing all of these things. Like th- that seed that they had planted is starting to like bear fruit and it's not good. And so God said, name your daughter, no mercy. In Romans 2, 5, in the NIV, it says, But because of your stubbornness and your unrepented heart, you are storing up wrath against yourself for the day of God's wrath. When his righteous judgment will be revealed, God will repay each person according to what they have done. To those who by persistence in doing good see glory, honor, and immortality, he will give them eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and who reject the truth and follow evil, they, there will be wrath and anger. There will be trouble and distress for every human being who does evil. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. Listen to this. For God does not show favoritism. You know, we have brown pride, white pride, Asian pride. We have all kind of pride. And all pride is bad, you know. And God says, I don't show favoritism. The Jew and the Gentile... If you are stubborn and you are unrepented, what awaits you on the righteous day of judgment is according to your acts. You're going to get what you deserve. So listen, you don't want to wait until God's righteous judgment is poured out on you. And if you don't know Christ today, you definitely don't want to wait until you die and God's righteous judgment proclaimed, depart from me, I never knew you. Those are such scary words to hear. So if you're a believer, you shouldn't wait. You should definitely repent of anything you're still holding on to. But if you're an unbeliever today and you don't know God, you definitely need to settle that with God today. You do not wait until you step into the next life to hear, depart from me, I never knew you. Because he will give to you according to what you did and what your works are when you don't repent and receive his mercy on this side of eternity once you die that's not offered to you anymore that is what's being offered here and now to the living god's mercy is still available to you right here right now don't miss it don't reject it and definitely don't take it for granted God does not show favoritism. I love it. The way he dealt with the children then is the way he deals with his children now. And then in Hosea 1.8, he goes on to say, Now when she had weaned Lu Ruhamah, she, received, uh, she conceived and bore a son. So now here's the third child. Then God said, call his name Lo-Ami. And listen to this. This means not my people. For you are not my people, and I will not be your God. We need to make sure today that we are, in fact, God's people. In John 8, 42 through 44, Jesus said to them, this speaking to the Pharisees, imagine the Pharisees, these are the religious leaders. They were in the church daily. And Jesus says things to them, if you... It says, if God were your father, because they thought they were right with God. And so Jesus tells them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come for myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you, because you are not able to listen to my words. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father, you want to do them. 
He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. And so speaking even to religious people, Jesus says, if you were really of God, you would love me and you would understand my words. And then in Matthew 7, 21 through 23, he says, not everyone, again, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. One of the most, he is the most loving person you will ever come across. People loved him. Women came to him. Children came to him. He was non-threatening, but he had to say these things. And in Matthew 7, 21, he says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The question is, do you love Jesus today? He says, if you really are of the family of God... You will love Jesus. If you are truly of the family of God, you will. You should not love or chase anyone or anything deeper or harder than you are chasing after Jesus Christ today. Do you understand his word and obey it? Because a lot of us think we're scholars. The Pharisees knew the word of God better than anybody else. And they did not love Jesus. In fact, they crucified Jesus. They were against the works of Jesus. So do you understand the word of God today where it changes the way you live? Where you don't just know it intellectually, but it literally changes who you are and transforms you? You would if God was your father. Do you desire, does your, the desires of your life, the desires of your heart resemble the heart of the devil? Or the heart of God? Does your walk align with the will of God? Does your life's message proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ? Or does it scream the lies of your father, the devil? When people hear you, can you, they take the word of God and say, yep, this lines up, this lines up. Or is the cheesy stuff you're saying just an echo of the world? Oh, you guys were meant for each other. Um, you know, yeah, you, you guys were, you know, you're just born. That guy's not a believer. You're a believer, sister. But, you know, oh, you know, just live and let live. What? Where, where is that in the Bible? So he's saying, do your, does your life and your words communicate Jesus? Or does it communicate your father, the devil? Because the Bible says that out of the abundance of your, the heart, the mouth speaks. And so what's coming out of your mouth is because it's going into the well of your heart and what's in there. I hope you're putting in Jesus. Well, Hosea 1.10 went on to say, Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured or numbered. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There, in that same place, it says, there it shall be said, you are sons of the living God. So in the place, in the very place where sin had to be confronted, addressed, dealt with, punished, the very place where God had pointed out that they were not his people, it was there that one day there would be restoration. It was in this very place that there can now be a promise of a future. And listen, today it may be hard for you to come into a place like this and to hear this message and to have God right now pulling at your heart spring, strings, pointing out the sin in your life, pointing out your compromise. And it's really hard to come to this place where your sin has to be confronted, addressed, and dealt with. And it may be hard to have to admit that your life, that your walk is not where it should be. But listen, if you will repent and you will call out to God, this is the place where there could be restoration. 
You could have walked in this place one way and you're going to walk out of this place a whole other way. And so in this very same place where God said, you are not my people and I am not your God, they were going to make a choice one day to call out to God and God was going to hear them and God would say, you are my people and gave them the promise that he would multiply them so much that you could not even number their descendants. In 2 Corinthians 6, 1, it says, We then, as workers together with him, also plead with you, not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So just the way the children of Israel had that appointed time where they would call out to God and God would hear them, listen, today for you is the day. Today is the day of acceptance. Today is the day of salvation. Just the way he heard them, he says, I will hear you. I will help you. So like the New Testament prophet, uh, the New Testament disciple Paul in 2 Corinthians when he says, I plead with you, I beg you, today I plead with you, I beg you to reflect on your life, reflect on your walk. Listen, God's grace may be free, but it wasn't cheap. It wasn't cheap. It's free to you, it's free to me, but somebody died for that. And not just anybody, God himself came into this world and died for you and I. Listen, salvation is free, but it's not cheap. And so he says, don't take it in vain. Do not receive it in vain. He died for you to give you the right to be children of God. John 1.11 says that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, he, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name. Did you know that you are not born right with God? You are not born a child of God. He gives you the right to become a child of God. To who? To those who receive him. It's your choice. If I gave you a gift today, it is your choice whether you want to open it and whether you want to receive it. Listen, a gift has been given to you. Salvation is by grace alone, in faith alone, in Christ alone. It is free to you. But you decide, do you want to receive it today? Do you want to receive it? If you do, you call out to God today. Do you want his help today? He's listening. He wants to hear you. He wants to help you. He promises to help you. Today is the acceptable time. Today is the day of salvation. Jesus is a great God. Jesus is a great husband. But what kind of bride are you? Are you still madly in love with him? Do you cling to his every word? Do you, I don't know about you, but when I first got saved, I loved going to church. You know, I, I go to church to this day. I always take a notepad. I always assume God is going to say something to me. Always. If you don't anticipate it, you're, you're not going to catch it. But if you really believe that God is going to speak to you, you're, you're, you're ready. You're ready. And I remember clinging to every word my pastor said to me. You know, when I got saved, I was already living with my boyfriend. I'd already had a son by him. And when I went to church, I didn't know anything about anything. You know, I'm hearing all this stuff for the first time. I wasn't raised Christian. You know, I didn't know any of this stuff. But I clung to every word. And when I heard that I shouldn't live the way I was living, I was like, oh, my God, that's me. Like, we got to talk to him after service right now. And so my husband and my boyfriend at the time and I walked up to the, the pastor in the front and we're like, we're living together. Does it count that we have a kid? No? Okay. <laughs> then what do we have to do? And let me tell you, at the age of 17, which I don't recommend to any 17-year-olds, at the age of 17, I went to court and I married this man because I wanted to be right with God. Amen. So do you still 
cling to his every word? Do you still crave his word? Do you get excited about going to church? Do you believe God has a word for you every Wednesday, every Sunday, or whenever it is that your church meets? God has a word for you. You are his bride. He is trying to transform you one verse at a time. Or have you become bored? Or maybe it's too strong and too independent. You just don't need him like you once did. Be careful. You have no idea how quickly you become prey to the enemy. The enemy who is looking for a loner to devour. Have you not seen the National Geographics? There is a lion always waiting for the little loner antelope. And here's the little loner antelope. Why isn't he with the herd? I don't know. But he's off in the water, you know, in the water hole, all by himself. And just like that, he went from being part of the herd to being the prey. You and I are not as strong as we think. The more honest you are with yourself about how easy it is for you to go back to the things God rescued you from. You know what I tell myself? I tell myself, the old Sonia, she's right there waiting for me. She's like, I'm right here, girl. <laughs> like, whenever you're ready, I'm right here. I can get in the flesh so quickly. That person is waiting for me. I don't ever deceive myself into thinking that I've somehow graduated. You know, Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, he said, I have not arrived. But one thing I know, forgetting the things which are behind, I'm pressing towards the front, right? But those things, your old friends, especially Facebook, Facebook is constantly reminding you of your old friends, and you're like, uh-uh, I left them back there. <laughs> Listen, the old you is always there. We are not as strong as we think, but the hand of God is with us. Amen. The hand of God is with us. Don't wait until he has to remove that to show you how much you needed him in the first place. So be careful. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. Or maybe the day to renew your vows. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we want to come before you right now.